Welcome to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. I'm Kevin Mahoney, the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, we check in with our capital correspondent, Sean Kitchen, on the good, bad, and the ugly that is Harrisburg, PA. Hey, and we're now on iTunes and Stitcher, so subscribe to the podcast and give us some feedback. Uh, Raging Chicken Radio is a project of Raging Chicken Press. Check, it us, check us out on all of our citizen journalism at ragingchickenpress.org. And if you like what you see, you like what you hear, click on the support and membership tab and become a member for as little as $5 a month and keep this activist journalism going. All right, so before we get right into it with Sean this week, um, I want to give a shout out to Ann Meter, who reached out to us from the DC Media Group. Her most recent piece, Did $200,000 Bail Keep Pipeline Activists Out of Sunoco's Way, is up on Raging Chicken Press. Meter digs into the struggle against uh, Mariner East 2 Pipeline up at Huntington County, PA. So go, go check her out and give her a shout out and give them some love down there, the DC Media Group. Uh, we also are looking forward to welcoming Joy Marie Manbeck to Raging Chicken Press. Joy is an activist campaigning with Bernie Sanders in PA. Uh, she was at that big rally last week that we did a little reporting on. So look for her reporting in the days ahead. And we've got even some more contributors on deck as well. And if you want to contribute to Raging Chicken Press, just drop us an email at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com. Uh, look us up, check us out, like us on Facebook, uh, tweet to us at, at RC Press, and uh, we'll kind of keep it going here. We're doing our best to keep activist media alive and kicking here in Pennsylvania. So uh, welcome, Sean. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Uh, pretty good. So you just put up this piece here uh, on this abortion bill, and I just I just want to le- read for folks the first couple sentences of your article, and then I'm just going to let you have at it. So yesterday, this is directly from your article. Yesterday, Pennsylvania House Republicans began putting what could be one of the country's most restrictive abortion bans on the legislative fast track with very little public notice or input. The forced birthing bill, House Bill 1948, was introduced last Friday and voted out of a House Health Committee by a 16 to 10 margin with two Democrats voting in favor. So here we go. The crazy is full upon us. Kind of walk us through what's going on here, Sean. In Pennsylvania. It's like we're living in Tom Corbett's fifth year again. I mean, we don't, we're going through another budget battle. We have people wanting to kneecap the budget process. And now we have legislators, the same legislator who brought the transvaginal ultrasound um, to us in three or four years ago when Governor Corbett said that women could just close their eyes. Well, she's back with another bill uh, that would ban all abortions after 20 weeks. Oh, my God. So what's the status of this bill? What are some of the provisions in this bill that um, that you say that this makes it one of the most restrictive abortion bans or abortion bills that's kind of on the books being pushed by these right wingers? Um, so what are some of the provisions in this bill? So the background of this bill is pain capable. Legisl- it's called pain capable. Pain ba- capable. Basically, at 20 weeks, a lot of these uh, pro-lifers claim that the fetus in the womb has developed a nervous system and pain sensors. And in order to have an abortion after 20 weeks, you have to dismember, dismemberment abortion, which cuts the fetus up out of the wound. And um, they have graphic photos of that. So they're calling a dismember, dismemberment abortion. Yes. Abortion. This that's, is the language. That's how they're framing it. Yes. That's how they're framing it. Dismemberment, pain-capable abortions, they're calling it. Um, this bill is originated by the National Right to Life Committee uh, five or, about five or six years ago, and um, it's finally making its way into Pennsylvania. This is unbelievable. So you just said this is in committee right now, or this just got voted out of committee? This got voted out of committee. It was uh, introduced on a Friday, last Friday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in, after Friday afternoon when no one had any – um, notice of it, and he had a five o'clock media dump pretty much. Then the bill was voted yesterday out of committee by a 16 to 10 vote with two Democrats voting in favor of it. And there will probably be a House floor vote on the bill on Wednesday. On Wednesday, so as in yes, tomorrow, as in tomorrow. And then the bill will, after that, the bill will be sent to the Senate, and it's up to the Senate to decide if they want to vote on the bill or not. And it's actually a pretty scary bill because of the makeup of the um legislature Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the democrats in the rural parts of the rural parts of the state are pretty conservative democrats um there's 114 republicans in the house they have a near supermajority hold of the house and they have a whole near supermajority hold of the senate 
And if they wanted to, they could would they there's a possibility they can override the governor's veto on this as early as next month. As early as next month. So this is a perfect example of why have somebody just having a D after their name is no guarantee that they're gonna they're gonna stand by and protect um, health care for women and women's right to choose. That's what I'm hearing from you. Is that right? Pretty much. Um, they're from rural Pennsylvania, and they're conservative when it's socially conservative. Well, these you know, the, go ahead. Sorry. So these are your blue dog Democrats that um that really are just white working class voter. They they go to that Donald Trump crowd, or they go to that crowd in the in the rural classes, white working class voters, and these people take um abortion pretty seriously. So the Democrats have to. Go step in line with that. They will not step out of line against these against their constituents on this issue, even if it means putting the health and welfare of millions of women at risk. Well, I mean, this also goes to speak to, I think, one of the failings of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, in my mind, because not only are we talking about, I mean, I get that these are conservative areas, but it also says that, you know, there's not been the kind of investment in a counter message in these areas. I mean, look, I mean, I get the conservative kind of the religious angle and that kind of stuff. And I understand why that's a big pushback. But you're also talking about some of the poorest regions of the state. Right. Right. These are parts of the state that have had their county health clinics shut down due to Governor P Governor Corbett's prior budgets. You know, these are places that don't have health care access to begin with. And these are also places that have most likely lost abortion clinics due to provisions that happened with um with the a bill that happened a couple years ago. The that was just uh, the Supreme Court, I believe, has taken this up. You know, you have to have you have to be in a hospital. You have to have hallways that are twenty feet wide. Pretty much have an actual operating room. Uh, uh, these are these are all the ones that are basically kind of trying to basically say you have to be a hospital in order to offer abortion clinics, like they did down in in Missouri and the kind of Mississippi, basically throughout the whole entire South. Right. So this is part of you know again once again these are coordinated efforts. Um, uh, across the country. It's not like some, you know, Pennsylvania legislator just kind of dreamed this up uh, and said, hey, you know, this might be a good idea. This is part of a, a kind of a national strategy is what you're mm -hmm. saying. And one of the things I was reading uh, when I, while doing the research on this, I think Charlie Thompson from Penn Live reported that I think 40% of all abortions in Pennsylvania are done within that 20 to 24 week time period. So you're going to have a massive reduction in abortions right there. And then um, another thing well, in legal abortions, right? In legal mean, abortions, yes. Right. So we're not abortion. talking about, I mean, ev all the studies show that, you know, just because you make something illegal does not mean that, that a woman is not going to seek out an abortion, right? Because this is really where it becomes about the kind of the health of the woman. So I, on that score, let me ask you this um, before we're kind of coming up close to a break. But let me ask you this. Is there, are there any provisions in that bill that deal with um, the kind of health and welfare of a woman? Yes, there are. Only two. Only all, abortion, all, all abortions are banned after 20 weeks in this bill. The only two that are not, if it prevents the mother from having complications, long-lasting complications from a failed pregnancy, or to save the mother's life. Rape, incest, and um, rape and incest are not in part of that. Unbelievable. So, so the woman, so either, either it, this has to be life-threatening or seriously debilitating um, in order for there to be an exception there. It doesn't matter how this woman got pregnant. doesn't mean she was raped. doesn't mean if she was a victim of incest. It doesn't mean, you know. And that also, if she, also, if the lady is carrying a failed pregnancy, she cannot have an abortion. We saw this last week in Texas. This bill is very similar right. to Texas House Bill 2 with Wendy Davis giving that epic, what, day-long filibuster on the bill. She, this, and the woman was forced to give birth to a stillborn baby. And this bill would do exactly the same thing in Pennsylvania if it were to become law. This is incredible. I'm telling you, right here in Pennsylvania, you know, we've got a lot to, uh, got a lot on our plates here, and we got people who are going to have to kind of be stepping up for this fall. So, listen, we're coming up to a break, and when we come back from a break, uh, I want to get into a little bit of some of uh, kind of what you're reporting in there, Sean, about uh, about the origins of this bill and uh, kind of what's behind it, because uh, if what you're reporting is accurate, then we're looking at some big money being thrown at this. So uh, we'll be back in uh, just a couple minutes. Uh, this is Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. Talk to you in a minute. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, the editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I'm talking here today once again with Sean Kitchen. Sean Kitchen is uh, just released a really kind of incredible report about some new legislation making its way through the Pennsylvania legislative bodies on restricting the access to 
abortion for women. Uh, so here's this kind of round of crazy going on. So Sean, um, now I, in this segment, I want to talk a little bit about you know some of the details or some of the backgrounds of this, so kind of how this stuff kind of got into play. Um, because I think once again, most folks are just becoming familiar with who Alec is um, and some of the the shenanigans that have been going on um, in terms of pushing legislation across the nation. Um, and you're kind of suggesting that this is also part of that effort. So in, in your piece, this is, this is kind of how you set it up. So you say, quote, the National Right to Life Committee operates in a similar fashion to the American Legislative Exchange Council, the legislative paper mill that is funded by the Koch brothers and pushes corporate friendly, pro-business, free market reforms in state governments across the country. The organization drafts forced birthing bills, distributes them throughout the country, and begins to rack up legislative victories. So you're saying that th that's what we're looking at here. This is exactly the same kind of pattern um, with this recent legislation in Pennsylvania. Right. In 2016 alone, um, we have seen bills like this in Idaho, South Dakota, New Hampshire, and a handful of other states. Um, those links are provided on the, in our article. You're, mm -hmm. You can look at these bills. And pretty much uses the same exact language that um, Representative Kathy Rapp's bill uses, but um, the bill, bill actually started in 2010. Um, the National Right to Life Committee um, introduced the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Model legislation, and it became law in Nebraska in 2010. However, in 2009. Um, the organization received a $25,000 donation from the Center to Protect Patient Rights. And if we remember them, they were bankrolled by Freedom Partners. Oh, God. So this was the Center for uh, to Protect Patient Rights was an anti-Obamacare group. Um, it was part of the Koch Brother infrastructure, along with the state policy networks, along with um, Freedom Partners and, and so many other groups that these billionaires fund. And it it might not seem like a lot of money. Twenty five thousand dollars does not seem like a lot of money for these groups, right? But when we're talking about state legislatures, you get more bang for your dollar on the local level. And since then, the group has been defunct, and it's now called American Encore. And American Encore has given millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to pro life, pro or an, pro life anti LGBT. Q organizations across the country. Oh, this is incredible. When I see that, you know, Think Progress has been um, trying to keep track of some of this stuff and some other organizations too as well. But, you know, it, it, what occurs to me is, you know, kind of walking through this is you've got this one organization called the Center to Protect Patient Rights, which again, if you see something on TV or somebody comes up and talks to you about this, and this sounds like, you know, an organization that's, you know, trying to help you out. So you might be, you know, willing to listen to what they have to say. And then once people kind of, you know, figure out who these folks are, they just kind of go bankrupt, they shut their doors and they reopen under a different name, American Encore, for example. Um, you know, I mean, who's keeping track of this stuff? There's a few groups. Um, I think, what, last week, last Friday, the Rick Smith Show had someone on mm -hmm. to talk about the Coke Stone Report, about the Coke Brothers operations in Pennsylvania. Um, we've been following this throughout this throughout the year with the pension reform, the budget issues that have been going on. You know, in Pennsylvania, we have Americans for Prosperity that operate here. We have the Commonwealth Foundation that are pushing these uh, pro-business reforms. And now we have anti-abortion legislation that can be pretty much traced back to uh, the, a Koch brother group that came out of destroying Obamacare in 2009. I mean, this might not be, this may not seem serious, but their origins comes from a $25,000 donation, 2009, to pass a law in 2010. No, but you know, frankly, look, twenty five thousand dollars is a lot of money in a, in a state legislature, right? I mean, that's yes, not, you, that's you get not more bang for your dollar on the state level, and yeah. the I mean, we've witnessed this with what the natural gas industry. You know, you you see some of these donations that people make only a thousand dollars. You're like, oh, well, it's a thousand dollars. It's not that much, but that thousand dollars gets you access to that person. Gets you access to that you know, that, that leader, that house speaker. No, exactly. And I think I, I, 
Right. And I find it kind of interesting, too, as well, is that you're going to you're seeing this kind of uptick and this kind of legislation happening here in Pennsylvania in a presidential election year. While everyone's eyes are focused on kind of the national election, the horse race for the next president of the United States. Um, and, you know, you take twenty five thousand dollars and you throw it into state races where the goal is not necessarily to get this person elected or that person elected, um, but to get some kind of key legislation passed before we see a changing of the guard. And it's kind of makes sense to me is like, especially when you got Trump at the front of the ticket, Trump or Cruz at the front of the ticket of the Republican Party. I mean, the Republican Party, the National Republican Party is, you know, is, is you know, basically preparing itself now for some huge losses. So then here you go, you got the Koch brother network and you've got some other, you know, kind of, you know, nationally funded organizations trying to kind of get through some state level um, legislation to kind of, you know, kind of secure what they can perceive as potential losses come to coming going forward. And we could talk about the, the timing of this bill. Right. Yeah, that, I wanted to get into that because you also it said, was, you know, it's not like that everyone goes, was out on the news talking about this bill, right? This happened in kind of a, not the coolest way. This bill was introduced, what, two or three days or literally the day after Donald Trump went after women saying that they should be punished for, you know, having abortions. They should be yep. put in jail for that. This this gets introduced the very next day. And then we are two weeks away from a primary in Pennsylvania. That's right. Right. So and possibly this can this uh, this should be watched i was talking to some legislators they're saying the senate's not interested in taking this up they're saying this is just a fundraise off of we're going to see pro gun led you're going to see more pro gun legislation come up just to rally up the base and throw red meat to them and but one legislator said this you might see a potential veto override and with this you have to prepare for the worst because of the dynamics of the house and of the senate well, kind of what you were saying there, too, is, you know, a lot of folks will say, well, I'll veto override and look at the number of R's, the number of D's, like, oh, no big deal. But like you said earlier on, is that you've got a lot of Democrats that are willing to join these right wing nut jobs and, and kind of joining for a veto override. And there's also Philadelphia area Democrats that are looking to do that, too. State Representative Brendan Boyle, now Congressman Brendan Boyle, voted and pushed these uh, pro-life reforms, you know, three, two or three years ago. He replaced Allison Schwartz, who was sta staunchly pro-choice. So he's in the office now. You have his brother, Kevin Boyle, who's voting for this. He's running for state senate right now, who will possibly, who could possibly support this. You have Margot Davidson in, in um, Upper Darby area, in the Delco area. She's voted for these bills in the past. You know, she might not vote for this bill on Wednesday, but if it's a veto override, she might be one of the 14 uh, Democrats to get the ball over that two-thirds majority line to veto override it. You know, you have 10 Democrats supporting this bill, right, who have put their name on it. Right. You have ten, that means you need four more for a veto override in the House. Right. I just named off two right there who didn't sign on to it. They probably would vote for it. And then the two in committee who voted for it weren't on that, weren't co sponsors. So right now you're at 14. I read that right there. You're at the uh, two thirds majority to veto override the governor. Man, I'm telling you. And that's scary. It's really scary. And it's, you know, this just puts me right back to, you know, something you and I talked about a couple of weeks back. It's like, you know, this is almost where you need that energy that's coming out of the John Fetterman campaign to begin to kind of re, you know, retool, redevelop, reimagine, or kind of re-energize the Democratic Party, or frankly, a third party at this point, right, which is willing to go in and challenge these nut jobs or primary, you know, these Democrats who are willing to sell out women down the road. I mean, and just, frankly, and yeah. frankly, if they, if this is an override and you have 14 or 15 Democrats voting for it mm -hmm. next month after the primaries, Frank Dermody, Marco, Markosik, Hannah should all lose their positions in leadership. They should be, they, the caucus should throw them out of their, their leadership position for allowing these defectors to vote for something this, this restrictive. Well, I agree. And they I think are, I, they, they are problem number one within the Democratic Party. I, I agree. But I also, and I also think that there's got to be a push from Democratic voters, right? From actual people to put the pressure upon um, the folks in the legislature. Because, you know, frankly, it's, a, a, you know, enough of this inside game, enough of this inside politics. I mean, people are going to have to start showing up and demanding the resignations of these people uh, because, you know, we just cannot continue to have this kind of nonsense happening here in Harrisburg. So listen, so we're coming up to a break and we're going to come back for a kind of a uh, little check in with Sean on sort of the fun side of things. Um, but, you know, I, folks, you know, get in touch with your legislator right now. 
I mean, this is the kind of thing that we should be standing up and saying absolutely no to in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, uh, this kind of nonsense, this kind of you know, national intervention into our state politics, um, it's just enough is enough. This is Kevin Mahoney from Raging Chicken Radio. Uh, we'll be right back. All right, we're back with Sean Kitchen. And uh, Sean, I got to say, man, it's, uh, it's good to have you back after uh, uh, your carb coma of last week. After stuffing yourself silly with cannolis, Italian pastries, freaking roast pork sandwiches from Tony Luke's, sharp, uh, extra sharp provolone cheese and spinach, My God. tomato pie, and all this other good stuff from uh, we, Philadelphia. We, we thought we were going to have to call 911 on you after, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of called you down there and all we got is this freaking sounded like a passed out snore guy, like on the phone. And, uh, you know, I capped it off with a nice trip to the forest in Maine, drinking no sours, stays on and just like, oh, good session beers at like four or 5% and had like a bunch of them. And definitely uh, put, Got to start start running again this week. Start yeah. hitting, uh, jumping rope. <laughs> yeah, get going, Easter Bunny. I mean, that's what <laughs> you got to be doing. So, uh, you know, I got to say, you know, w- right off the bat, last night, freaking most amazing NCAA uh, men's final I've seen in ages. And you're a big Nova fan, in my understanding. Yes, I've been a Nova fan since I was like nine or ten years old growing up. Um my parents, both my parents worked at LaSalle University. And whenever I had an opportunity, they were working the LaSalle the Villanova games. I'd always go to uh, those games and root for Villanova as a kid growing up, you know, royally pissing off my parents and some of their coworkers that I was supporting <laughs> the other side. But uh, I've been following Jay Wright ever since he started coaching there pretty much. And they've always been one of my favorite teams. You know, I tell you, you know, I, I tell you, you know, I'm an I'm an SU guy, right? You know, so uh, and you know, SU lost to North Carolina, uh, you know, coming in the Final Four, uh, and you know, I think I said this to you last night online is like, you know, after watching North Carolina really pick apart the SU zone um, and the paint and stuff, I was just floored to see uh, the intensity of Villanova's uh, defense against North Carolina. Um, you know, I mean, their their shooting percentage on the floor was down a little bit from what it had been throughout the tournament, but man, their defense was amazing. But they were doing this the whole entire tournament, just shutting down the key offensive players right. from every team. And one of the things I thought was amazing was, I mean, I just love college basketball. I don't really follow college football because that's really just like a minor league system for the NFL. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like you have stories like this with Villanova, like four or five seniors that'll never play basketball again in their lives for any organized team uh, coming out and just beating possibly like three or four all pros, you know, later on down the line in their careers against UNC on a last second shot. I mean, that's just, I mean, that, that, that's why I just love the sport. I mean, it's, it's not just Villanova. I mean, any sport, any like college basketball game like that right, is always right. fun to watch when you have someone like a smaller caliber school, school like Villanova taking on your prodigy programs like Duke, UNC, Connecticut. It was just, it was awesome to watch. Um, I yeah, I'm just a total college basketball geek when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I'll tell you, I'm still looking forward to uh, you know SU still got a chance with the uh, you know the SU's women's basketball team is in the finals against the Huskies, and so I'm gonna be giving them a shout out. But man, kudos to Nova, man. That was that was an amazing amazing game. Oh yeah, it was really awesome. Yeah. So rumor has it that you're making your way back into Philadelphia for some more uh, carb coma kind of material. What's going on? Uh, yeah, this Sunday, uh, Forest in Maine, which is a nice little brewery in this small Victorian 1800s house, 1890, where the building was built on the corner property of Forest in Maine in Ambler. It's having their third anniversary party. Um, the first time I went there, I was home from summer break in college, and I absolutely fell in love with the place. You know, five, it was like five o'clock, six o'clock on a Friday afternoon, three or four years ago, and uh, there were about like 60 people on the front lawn all the overflow of the people from the brewery. And it's pretty much, it's, it has a nice, like small homey feeling to that. Um, they don't get notarized. They should. I think that their beers are better than tired hands. Um, who also special in like saisons and sours. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's great going back home and seeing, getting back with the gang. I'd go there on a weekly basis before I moved up to Harrisburg for a trivia night every Thursday night. And, uh, indulge in some pleasantries I ha- don't normally do anymore. <laughs> so that's uh, that's starting at this weekend at, at noon. Is that what you told me? Like noon on Sunday? It's going to be Sunday all day up there? Sunday at noon um, in Ambler. There will be – the party will start. There will be live music. There will be uh, hot dogs sold off the front porch. Um, 
what they do throughout the year. They have special bottle releases where it's like twelve or fifteen dollars for like a five hundred or seven fifty milliliter milliliter bottle. But what they do is they put a quarter keg or two aside throughout the year and just let those puppies ferment and ferment and ferment and gets more funky or more sour. They'll put their uh, Marius on, which is a Lambic style blueberry beer, um, blueberry sour on. They'll have a couple of other Mariuses on. Yeah, it's just it's just like that one time a year you get to try all these great beers that they put out. And you don't, you're not putting out 15 or $20 for a bottle. Right, right, right. Well, there you have it, folks. I mean, this is uh, you know word from Sean Kitchen. You know, <laughs> if you're in the area, you're down in Ambler, uh, Forest and Maine's third anniversary party, you said? Yes, and third anniversary I will be party. driving responsibly. I will be parking my car at my house. I'm about like a 10-minute ride away. Mm-hmm. And I'll have my parents drop me off and pick me up. So 27-year-old, 26-year-old. Yeah, that's right. We'll be chaperoned. It's good to have <laughs> mommy and daddy close down the road. It got there. All right, this has been Out the Cape hey. Podcast. This is Raging Chicken Radio. Uh, we'll say see you later, Sean, and uh, hope to see you next week if you're not in your next carbon deuce coma. Um, I, I should be here. <laughs> yeah, should is the operative word. All right, we'll talk to you then. We're out. All right, I'll see you later. Have a good one. See ya.